Hello and welcome to episode number 28 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This episode is the final interview of this whole podcast's run, and we end with one of the most interesting and thoughtful people I've ever known within this profession and beyond it. I've decided to close up this little program because at the end of June, I'm stepping down from my chair as principal second violin of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra to pursue a master's degree in public administration at Harvard at the Kennedy School of Government. And a perfectly reasonable question that many folks have asked, especially given the state of the performing arts during this pandemic, is if this decision is COVID related. And the short answer is no. And for what it's worth, the RPO, my orchestra, has survived this crisis quite well. And we're quite possibly stronger now than when COVID began. And I think that's most true from a people perspective. I started performing labor in May of last year, 2020. And while it has been concurrent with the rise and fall of COVID, it's never been just about the performing arts and how musicians might navigate this difficult time but rather an opportunity to talk with working musicians whom I admire and are doing interesting things from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. And nobody embodies that more than our final guest, Alex Lang, the principal clarinetist of the Phoenix Symphony. The Maryland native was the 2017 Sphinx Medal of Excellence recipient. He's a graduate of the Manhattan School of Music and Northwestern University. He was a fellow at the New World Symphony, the Detroit Symphony, and the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. Alex can be heard on Disney's The Lion King soundtrack, and he's both an orchestra and board member of the Gateways Festival Orchestra, based right here in Rochester, actually. And it was just announced that that orchestra will be making its Carnegie Hall debut in April of 2022. I met Alex back in 2004 when I joined the Phoenix Symphony. And over my 20 years in the career, I've moved orchestras four times, probably more than many of my peers, but that move to Phoenix really stands out to me. And it's not just that I move to a bigger city and to an orchestra with a bigger budget. For a variety of reasons, structural, contractual, and those that are harder to quantify, the orchestra carried itself differently from where I had been before. Actually, I've got three very clear recollections of when it was obvious where the expectations were going to be different. And one was one of the very first shows I ever played in Phoenix. It was a season preview concert, and Alex played a stunning performance of the Mozart Clarinet Concerto, the second movement, with the orchestra. But it was also clear early on that Alex was more than a star principal player. He was also the intellectual engine of the orchestra. As the name of this podcast suggests, as performing labor suggests, being a member of a union is a defining part of an orchestra player's experience. And unionism takes this activity that we've done since we were kids and maps on a maturity and a seriousness to the responsibilities of this work. We bargain collectively for terms that have material impact on the lives of our colleagues. And sometimes, like I did in Phoenix, you'll find yourself in places conservatory just doesn't prepare you for, like giving sworn testimony to the National Labor Relations Board. But what Alex brought to his formal role as orchestra committee chair and informally as a member of the core of players was a commitment to thinking about the institution, how it functioned, how people related to each other, different incentives, how we make collective progress, and even why do we do this? It was an incredibly important counterbalance, especially given what the orchestra was going through. I got to serve in those days with great tactical union leaders from the orchestra, and those experiences taught me about the mechanics of how an orchestra runs. But my relationship with Alex and those conversations were the foundations of how I think about the message and morale of the institution. In the interview, he expresses some skepticism about his efficacy in those early days in Phoenix. But those proverbial 10,000 hours of practice of thinking, of writing, organizing, presenting, made Alex a sought-after national and international industry leader today. He collaborates with the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles, is a faculty member for both the National Youth Orchestra of the United States and the League of American Orchestras Essentials of Orchestra Management Seminar. And more recently, he has joined the creative team for the long-running national public radio show for young musicians, From the Top. Looking back, all that work that Alex did in Phoenix may not have paid off fully for that institution, but he's had obvious impact on the industry. And on a more personal note, the ideas that we wrestled with together 
became the foundations of my own concept of institutional citizenship. And some of the ideas he talks about in this interview intersect with my own decision to leave the concert stage for work in public service. I think because classical music's training and the work of the profession, with its long traditions and its methods and its theories and its demands on the individual, there undoubtedly are ingredients for accomplishing great things, of which, and I know I'm biased, but I think the orchestra is the best representative. But there are dangers in the training and in this work, uh, threats of stagnation, a resistance to learning and change, and working more mechanically than being cognizant of the humanity around you. And to the degree that I've avoided those traps, I owe some debt to Alex. I'll close with something I read recently that I think captures that idea, where we might confuse executing learned habits versus engaging with lifelong learning. And it's by the University of Chicago philosophy professor, Agnes Callard. Agency, as distinct from mere behavior, is marked by practical rationality. Insofar as becoming someone is something that someone does and not something that merely happens to her, she must have access to reasons to become the person she will be. Please enjoy this conversation with Alex Lang. Alex Lang, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, man. So I can't think of a more fitting way to wind this podcast project down than a conversation with you. You mean you've been an enormous positive influence on me. Uh, well, first of all, because of our friendship, but professionally, uh, certainly one of the most professional and put together players, someone who brings consistency week after week and keeps improving season after season, but also put you in the 0.1% of people reflecting on the profession, thinking forward about it and improving the intellectual life of our field. And of the many things that you said to me that stuck with me over the years, and one in particular that I, because I see it over and over years and years after we ceased working together. And the line you used was something to the effect of an orchestral career is a choose your own adventure novel. And for me, I took that to mean that in the absence of dedicated time and space to debate and to argue and to come to consensus, that we just create our own self-conceptions about the work and we go on making a lot of assumptions and listening to our own monologues. So I'd love to hear you expand on that idea, on that quote. Maybe talk to me about what you were sensing when you first put your finger on it and maybe connect it to what we're facing now as we're in the midst of making our way through this health crisis. Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say back at you, uh, I, you know, we were together at a really dynamic time in our own personal lives as artists and professionals, but also in the life cycle of the orchestra. We were both part of the Phoenix Symphony. So I, I'm also grateful for that time. I feel like it's like an iron sharpens iron type thing. Um, grateful for the camaraderie, but also the the intellectual exchange and stimulation and glad that we still get to do it, right? Though not as often as we used to. So relative to that phrase or quote, you know, so many of us, right? You're attracted to this field by a set of experiences that happen, you know, especially now I'm almost 50, that all of them were when I was young, right? So the introduction to the instrument, the introduction to the feeling it gives me to, to play well, to accomplish stuff, to get better, the introduction to the way people responded, but also the introduction to like what it feels like to be in, or, in an orchestra. I did, you know, a, a path that lots of people did. Mine was a little heavy on the sort of future casting training programs. So I, I did a master's in orchestral performance at Manhattan School of Music. After that, I left and played in the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, which had a little bit of a future casting feel, and then spent a very short period of time in New World before I came to Phoenix, which definitely had sort of a future casting feel. I think for me, you know, another part of my story is these two poles, interest, goals, energies were organized around, right? One was so-called classical music and the clarinet, and getting good at that and um, you know, striving to make that my vocation. And the other was a desire to be close to, in relationship with, relevant to Black people, Black culture. And there's a tension between those two things. 
that I started to feel like I could see a path towards resolving when I got to Manhattan School, because it was the first time that I had heard the phrase like community engaged music making. And I started hearing about and seeing ways that this art form or artists could show up in the black community. Now, looking back on those programs and ideas, like I don't subscribe to many of those programs and ideas and language and framing now, but that's sort of where, uh, for me, that really fueled like my imagination, it fueled my drive. It wasn't th these ideas of like what an orchestra could mean to a community. Americanizing the American Orchestra came out just before I went to grad school. So it was like a topic of conversation. We mm -hmm. looked at it. These ideas were like stimulating and exciting for me. The idea that an orchestra was trying to be, or an orchestra might try to be relevant to black people, that it might try to measure itself on its ability to engage, attract, reflect, black culture, black people. This was, I was like, oh, I didn't, you know, this was, this was, that was like big for me. So that was kind of like my perspective. I remember when I got to the gig in Phoenix, I came, I actually joined the orchestra at a inflection point. You did too, a point, a, a place of transition. The orchestra was like intentionally, had gone through a crisis, pretty devastating one, and was, uh, had set itself about intentionally trying to become something different. I actually think like we were really fortunate, you and I, to be in an orchestra, despite how like, you know, spoiler mm -hmm. alert, it went terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but despite that, we, you and I like shared this experience of like, what does it feel like if an orchestra like says out loud and intentionally starts to try and change itself, its culture? In any case, uh, what I found in, in short order, like I had this mindset coming out of New World and Manhattan School and all the training and, and uh, the Detroit Symphony's African American Fellowship Program, that the field wanted me and was and, and, and that I just needed to like get some power going through my, bo my body and my art form. And that when I got to an orchestra, I would just have to plug in. Mm -hmm. And actually the experience I found when I came to Phoenix, and I think this is an experience lots of musicians have when they join an orchestra and especially like the ones who are um, tilted towards a quote unquote like future cast sort of idea of what the art form might be they find oh wow for all the talk like there's nowhere to forget about like if they think i'm a good appliance there's nowhere to even plug this thing in mm -hmm. like there's no and so that was like um took me a while to sort of figure out that's what was that's what it was like there's they don't even know they don't know what to do with you saying this having these ideas or wanting to participate in the um the frames of meaning that you know surround the art form or what the work is or where we should be going or playing or what we should be playing and and, and what does this all mean so the next sort of major thing that helped me make sense of stuff I haven't lost sight of the Choose Your Own Adventure was, um, and you remember this, I went, uh, I sort of reached the limits of like, we, so we were engaged in this really dynamic struggle inside the organization about what we were going and, you know, big schism between management and musician, not insignificant schism within the musician group. I remember being particularly like frustrated and offended because I, a lot of the language that was being used to sort of describe what we were trying to do as an organization. And it was about you know, a lot of language I was very familiar with from all of these programs and reading and training, but the actual like way it was manifesting was I thought actually quite backwards looking in terms of like where power was located, you know? So we were like, we're using the language of like becoming a 21st century orchestra to actually become more like a 19th century orchestra. In any case, I availed myself of uh, Arizona State University and did a two-year program, professional development, not a degree, but a certificate program in nonprofit management through the Lodestar Center for Philanthropy and Innovation, I think is their official title. You know, these things are always shifting. In any case, the point is I was exposed to uh, the work of Bowman and Deal and this idea of uh, analyzing organizations through four frames. So it's a big old textbook called Reframing Organizations by Lee Bowman and Terrence Deal. And a professor who I really admired and respected had 
shared that like this book was critical to her understanding. I'm so impressed with her and wanted to know what she knows. So I read this whole thing like pretty intensely. And um, what Bowman and Deal posit in a nutshell is that every organization can be understood to actually be um, existing in four distinct ways simultaneously. So, uh, and, and that the way you frame the organization will reveal different things. So one frame is the structural frame. Who reports to whom? How do the widgets get made? Another frame is the human resources frame. And in that frame, we not only, of course, see the people, but we also see like frames of meaning, compensation, valuation, right? So it's more than just benefits and compensation. It's what does work mean? Um, and all, of the, all that comes with that. Another frame is the political frame, right? How do agendas get set? Uh, the fight for scarce resources, the fight for power. The last frame is the symbolic frame. Um, what does the organization mean? How do we show up? And there's an accompanying metaphor for each one. So the structural is the organization as a factory. The human resources is the organization as a family. The political is the organization as a jungle. And the symbolic is the organization as a temple. And what I found was when you look at an orchestra that way, when you look at it through the structural frame, you actually see a very rich life. That frame is very well populated. It's very clear who reports to whom and how the widgets get made. When you look through the political frame, again, you actually see a very rich life there, right? We bargain collectively. I also think when you look through the political frame, that's where you actually see the donors, right? So you don't see the donors when you look through the structural frame, not really. When you look through the political frame, right? Oh, that's where the donors really show up. And we all have had that experience. It's why we, and we do a lot of, we, we do a lot of work, like cultivating them. Uh, we are responsive to them, you know, fill in the blanks, biggest donor can alter the, alter anything pretty much, right? I mean, and they can even exert power sometimes inside the structural thing. When you look through an orchestra, though, through the human resources frame, you don't see anything, is my opinion. And when you look through the orchestra through the symbolic frame, you don't see any ability to engage with or interrogate that. But it is the human resources, the orchestra as a family, and the symbolic, the orchestra. Oh, I didn't know if I finished the loop, but the symbolic metaphor is the organization as a temple, a church, or a circus, if you want to have a completely secular one. So I think what's interesting is musicians were brought into this thing actually by our relationship to things that would live in the human resources frame, right? How does this make me feel? Being in relationship to other people, what do those relationships mean? What do they bring to me? What do they give to me? Part of a unit, part of a tribe. And the symbolic as well is rich. And I think the symbolic is the one that I was really animated around like, oh, we are trying to, and there's the possibility that we are going to try to craft a new narrative for what our symbolic, what we symbolize, right? And the idea that we are gonna symbolize something that if not centers, at least recognizes and values black American culture as an as American orchestras. Not at, to the exclusion of anything else, but in response to the fact that we've intentionally excluded that mm -hmm. historically, right? And so um, what I think happens to us is and so as evidence of the human resources thing, for instance, our contracts, there are pages in every one of our contracts that contemplates yours and my degradation. Here's what's going to happen if the powers that be, either a section leader, a principal, or however we've delineated this power in our organization decides that Rob or Alex have lost a step. First, this is going to happen. By this date, this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Then there's going to be a pause. And it goes on for pages. You and I have even worked on some of these documents, right? I think what is interesting, though, is that there is nothing in there that contemplates my evolution, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a clear sign that the organization believes that you don't need to evolve, right? Because there's a narrative in place that we are hiring finished products. And so all we need to worry about is if the car starts to wear out. But the idea that the car is going to evolve over time, like that's crazy. Cars don't evolve. All they do is wear out. So we need to have a plan in place for when that, if and when that happens. Uh, and then on the symbolic piece, that's, we just sort of inherited that, right? There isn't any space to like, we never talk about like, what does this mean? 
And why aren't there any black people in the audience? And does that matter to us? Or whatever, what, you know, whoever you look at and feel is missing. We don't even sort of contemplate the audience really that much at all. So I think when I said it's a choose your own adventure, I mean to say that like the things that attract and animate us and bring us to this field are not cultivated, supported, or really guided by the institution. And so you're left with this choose your own adventure of like, how am I gonna, how, how am I going to continue to do this thing in a way that is meaningful to me? How do I, how do I tell myself a story that this is good or satisfying? Or how do I make sense of the fact that like the things that animated me and were meaningful to me when I was 28 are not the same things as when I'm 38 or 48. And that's where the choose your own adventure comes in, right? That everyone is sort of left to their own to make sense of this, to make it make sense, to deal with the reality of a less agency and ability to impact the machine than you imagined when you signed up for this or when you fought like crazy to get into this thing. I think ultimately though, and I, I know I'm pretty sure I said this back then, but I say it now for sure is, I think embedded in that is actually a good news story. I don't want to embarrass any of our shared colleagues, but I think we can both think of colleagues who are like archetypes of like, you know, have, have created decent stories for themselves and are good colleagues and, they're, and they, they are, um, pleasant to be around and to make music with. And I think it's actually quite miraculous that in the absence of like any HR strategy from how you take someone from age 28 to 58 or 68 without any support really from the organization um, with the ups and downs of that, with a body that's changing, people, a lot of people are making pretty good choices. And I think the good news is, is you know, what if we just put like, really anything, but like, you know, some, some mo relatively moderate amount towards trying to shape this towards some aim, how much, how much could we get? Now, it's not just a good news story because the, to the point of people making good choices, the idea that the institution can come in now and make those choices better is probably ill-advised. I think uh, relative, especially to the work you're about to go and do, what comes to mind for me is some of the ways that they deal with um, food scarcity and like big NGO programs. And there used to be this like, we have the answers and we're gonna come in. And they've, I think of, you know, I've read some stuff where like some places have now adopted or switched to a different way where it's like you come in and you see who's doing well, given the same set of circumstances, and you observe them, right? And then you try to draw out from them, like, what is that family doing that on the same circumstances as these other families, their kids are less malnourished? And can we build some programs and interventions around what the people in the circumstances have actually come up with? So that's what I would say about like, it's, it's a good news story. And there are lots of people figuring this out and maybe we could build around that and support that. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's a, that's the whole choose your own adventure. I want to go back quickly to the good news story versus the idea that our contracts are set up to account only for degradation. Mm -hmm. And there's someone whose books I've been getting into this over the, over this quarantine and health crisis, uh, John Garner, who was um, mm. in the Lyndon Johnson administration. He was the one mm. Republican. Mm. And for whatever reason, some quote, I, I was familiar with his work, but for whatever reason, one of the things just lit up on the page in someone else's book and I've followed down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And basically he wrote the same book 10 times, which mm -hmm. is how to self renewal, excellence, mm -hmm. equality, all these things come from renewal rather mm -hmm. than letting things erode under your feet. Mm -hmm. And that that regenerative purpose is mm -hmm. an antibody against mm -hmm. uh, demagogues or mm -hmm. bad actors or opportunists. Mm -hmm. So how do you think then that in this moment, is there a particular opportunity for us to shape new values and shared values in this instant as an institution that then shapes its employees? One of the things I've been thinking about is how often orchestral crises happen out of step 
with national crises. So mm. like when I joined the Richmond Symphony it was literally the day after 9-11. And so mm. in my mind, really the crisis was this, this sort of national crisis that had happened. But really we were facing the consequences of the, the mm -hmm. dot-com bubble implosion, mm -hmm. the financial mm -hmm. repercussions of that. It was mm -hmm. three or four years yeah, three or four years, five years after the fact, and we were wrestling with that. Not so incredibly dissimilar in a lot of orchestras after the after the subprime mortgage meltdown. Is there something different now in the water, perhaps because we're going through this with the rest of society? The re Nike is rethinking what it's doing. You know, Ford just released an <laughs> electric Ford 150. Like everyone's thinking differently. Do we have a particular opportunity in this time then to shape purpose? The short answer is yes. I believe that we do. The mitigant I would offer about why we we still might not has to do with the fact that before we can even engage with the what should we do differently, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to actually have to like build some space inside our organizations in which we reflect. And so there's labor to be done just to like build the room and put together the meeting table before we can even like Think about will it be an effective meeting and will anything change as well and i'm using you know rooms and meeting tables metaphorically mm -hmm. obviously um so i think that's a challenge right and then i think when you look at the fact that most orchestras are strapped for resources it becomes even more of a like not necessarily long shot but that's it that's another mitigant because ford is set up to think about what should the next car be they have an R and D lab. They have. They. They also don't believe that like the Model T will satisfy everyone forever because it is classical, and it is free of the surly bonds of time and space and place and even the whims of the mar right. You know. So we have a mentality in place about what we do that is disposed against reflection. That is disposed against renewal that is disposed against change change on anyone's part the idea that like the only change you could make as a violinist rob is get worse we don't know what to do with you if you get better uh big uh, choose an adventure i don't know right i mean <laughs> there isn't there isn't a thought of like wh what are we you know uh, we're, we're disposed even our whole sort of audition process of course but the, even the narrative we have that you like, we need to determine if Rob Simons is a good fit for us because what we are is static and unchanging. First off, that just doesn't actually take an accounting of like human beings and how we work. And, you know, the, I think a, 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 a more accurate and certainly more beneficial narrative for us would be every time we hire, we add someone, we become a new ensemble. And I think you can understand that in chamber music, the idea that like, but even Kronos tries to be like, well, we're still Kronos. So I think that on, a, on an experiential way, you know, when you change the cellist in a string quartet, its purpose might not have changed, but as a quartet, it's a different quartet. Mm -hmm. It feels different, it acts different, there's different dynamics. Some things are better. Oh, that I missed that thing. Can we do more of that? You know, so I just think like that narrative of like adding a new player makes us a new ensemble, makes us a new section. A new second violinist means we're a new section. That story would serve us far better than the story of we are static and unchanging and we need to put you through all these paces to find out whether or not you are the right fit for us because what? We are never changing. That's the, so I think those are all real challenges to this, right? Not just the lack of resources, the no meeting room, the no table, but also a, a mindset that does not incline itself towards anything changing. Certainly not frames of meaning. It does seem though that it's especially ripe right now and that Ford may be set up to think about these things, but they're changing something that's not broken. Like we're in an environment where we're changing, like it's the best selling vehicle in America. It's been since the Reagan administration, they sell 900,000 of these things a year. It's the best vehicle I ever owned. What's a Ford 150 right, like, right, right. in terms of reliability and drivability. Sure. Um, I remember that thing. But the I think that we're in, in a particular an environment where lots of organizations from top to bottom are thinking about these kinds of changes. You, I think you said before that we're kind of built for stasis, right? So if we're going to accept that there, our current status quo is stasis, how does an institution change its set of shared purposes to exploit and um, explore the talents of their membership? So I think as it relates to like representation, more black people on stage, Let's say that's the thing that 
you know, that could change because of activity inside the political frame. So if the mayor of a city decided that particular orchestra was a useful means by which they want to communicate their commitment to representational diversity, they could launch a, they, we could be just a, a continual line about that. And depending on uh, who was on your board and what their political power was, they may not really pay any price for that, especially if that's where their, if it's, if it's a narrative that resonated with the political base that they were beholden to or responsive to, right? That like there could be, so that, so that would, that could then lead to an orchestra really scrambling quickly to try to get off of that firing line, especially if it were an orchestra that has made a, some amount of noise in the historical record, maybe going back 60 years, right? Of which there are kind of all of us, really. That could cascade like changes in terms of hiring. I would say though, that that is not likely to cascade significant changes in the organization unless the numbers were so high such that it really did become, you know, a different orchestra. But you and I both know that despite, you know, my interests and how many unsolicited speeches have I given to our colleagues? Like I haven't really moved the needle inside the Phoenix Symphony. I'm grateful for this to be clear. I'm okay with that. I'm grateful for the practice space. I'm grateful that like the national audience wasn't paying attention to anything I had to say for a while. And I got to like work some stuff out. And so Phoenix was definitely a part of that. But you know what I'm saying? Like that might change like representation and you might get like five hires or whatever the thing might be, but the inertia of the system is greater than that. The idea that we don't have a particular sound as much as we have a particular process. I actually feel like that's where the real, is that, and that is actually the people that distinguish this orchestra, not its sound, which is, I think is actually the true story. And I got pretty good ears, but I was listening the other day, I read an article in the New York Times about like, you know, five classical recordings to listen to. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, I, I, I like something that the New York Times writes about music, or I find it interesting. Often not, right? It's like, I'm not, but I was like, oh, this, okay. And one of them was a recording of Beethoven seven and eight, maybe, or something. And they described it in such terms, man, right? I mean, you can, you're smiling. I know you can imagine what it was saying and all this stuff. So I got excited and I click through and I go find the recording and I listen to it. And guess what? It sounded like Beethoven 7. Like a good performance of Beethoven 7. <laughs> but I really expected it to be really different. Honestly, you know, the, the most different and interesting Beethoven I've ever heard is the uh, Orchestra of the Age and Enlightenment. Like when the, the, the period instrument, that is interesting. And some of those tempos and that's like different. But this thing, which was like a great orchestra, and it was, it was a great orchestra, great conductor. It sounded like, you know, the thing, which is great. And I think that like, what distinguishes my orchestra from your orchestra might maybe some drop the needle stuff, maybe. But I think the biggest distinction, I know for me personally, the biggest difference between me and my peer in the principal clarinetist of the San Diego Symphony or in Denver is my person and what I believe about what this thing means and what I'm trying to make it mean for myself and for other people. So, is this a place though where where the, the symbolic part of the frames comes in, and forgive me if I'm mixing up terminology here, and then your your idea of practice is performance. Then mm -hmm. if, if, if a Beethoven seven, mm -hmm. for most ears, mm -hmm. yours and mine included sometimes, mm -hmm. but certainly for the average person, the mm -hmm. uh, or average listener, is kind of generic, is then the internal operations if those things are revealed that these are dynamic workplaces and, mm -hmm. and in those dynamic workplaces, we're expressing certain values. Is that mm -hmm. a way that you see that the orchestra has uh, downstream effects on its community? Yeah, I, uh, well, I, I think that, you know, it's interesting. So you're, refer you're referencing this uh, process as performance thing I, I, I dropped in Nashville at this concert, at conference. Yeah, so what I was trying to do there was think through what is a framework under because I was tr what I, I was talking about this question of like on the one hand orchestras have been saying for more than half a century that they want to be in relation to black people differently 
in their ensembles, on their stage, in their hall, in their audience, in their cities. And yet here we are largely the same. Audience looks the same, stage looks the same. And it's not just like a moral thing to the degree that it's moral for anyone. It's like, there's a lot of good reason to make sort of the business case of how like, this is not like great for an orchestra uh, in America and in this particular city, whatever that city might be. And you can cut this different ways. I think that um, the challenge, of course, around that is we have a narrative in place that is indifferent to these things. So the narrative for like how we hire the orchestra, the narrative for what makes for a stimulating experience for the audience, the narrative is indifferent to race or identity or anything, right? We, we labor under a, even a narrative aesthetically that is like the concert hall is a place for commune between two minds, yours and the composers. And if we do it right, everything else falls away. The person you're sitting next to has nothing to do with that. The orchestra can only mess it up. The, the, <laughs> the, the piece exists in its perfected form as an idea that the composer wrote down and even the medium of like writing and the symbols and piano is ultimately something of a limit that various composers try to get around you know Mahler with like lots of words Tchaikovsky with hyper pianists like you know oh okay you put six p's there which is like <laughs> not a thing <laughs> okay you must mean like something different than pian pianissimo like something more like okay I, I, I feel you Tchaikovsky Right, but ultimately it's like, it's an idea, it's an asymptote. So that narrative is indifferent to all of this thing. And so it's not, it's no wonder that we've not made any movement on it. And what I was trying to do with that was introduce, not like a marketing thing, like a narrative under which this stuff might start to matter. And I felt at the time, based on where I was in my evolution and also the audience I was speaking to, that this would be a useful way of like introducing this idea. And I pointed to, the Food Network, right, which is actually all about the process of making food. And that is like what makes and I, and I at the time was like watching a lot of those shows with my wife and Chopped and they're like fun and interesting and also. But, it, you know, and yes, there is a you can't taste the food. So it's like you don't even get to participate that as an audience member. But I found it still like compelling and interesting. And what I started to think about was, oh, by making the process of making it the story the individuals now are showing up in a different way because it's not like the camera is just like two hands, like it's not an above shot and I'm just seeing the technique of the thing. It's their story, it's their struggle, it's their why, it's what they're trying to do with food, it's where they're from, it's where they're going. And so I ended with this idea of like saying that like we are organized like a 1950s restaurant where the process is all hidden behind the big swinging doors. And we do that by design. We hide the process from each other. We hide the struggle from each other. We hide the striving from each other because we labor under this larger story, which says, you know, an orchestra is a place for stuff that is finished, an art form that has been perfected. Music has been perfected, right? That's why we're the best. That's why we get the big hall at the corner of State and Maine or Second in Washington or whatever the thing is, because this is the best music played by the best musicians. It's done, come witness it. We're not even gonna look at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how you feel about this is like, again, a choose your own adventure. It's not gonna determine if not whether or not this was a good show. It might determine whether or not we can have more shows, but the goodness of it is not about how you feel. Unlike some of the concerts we've talked about that you've been into lately. Um, so I what I was trying, that's what I was trying to do with that. And I I landed with the idea of like, what would an open kitchen orchestra be? And I think if we could move towards that, that creates a reason by which like the striving and the struggle and the making meaning and making sense becomes more of what we are offering to people and why we think this is valuable in the way that I think like watching someone cook is valuable, not to, you know, see the, the disembodied hands, you know, from with an above camera shot, but the, but the person and what it's about. And I, I think that, um, Something I did read in the New York Times, man, we're gonna they, we're gonna edit all this out. No free advertising, Rob, on your podcast <laughs> for them. But um, <laughs> um, I read an article in terms of a concert I read about in the New York Times, and I was like, man, I want to go to this concert. And there was an article about Andre Watts, 
and uh, revealed to me, I wasn't aware of, that he was uh, battling cancer and also battling a uh, left arm problem. And he had not canceled concertizing dates uh, unless he absolutely had to. And he was striving and struggling to make every one of them. And he was, he had arranged Ravel's left hand piano concerto for the right hand, which I, my lowest grade on my college transcript is my last semester of keyboard skills. I was like, I wouldn't have gotten through that if I hadn't brought the TA beer. <laughs> but <laughs> and, you know, we were both just like eager to end this relationship. So he was <laughs> like, please just go away. <laughs> um, the point being though, and the article talked about how like, it's not perfect, right? Cause it's like not, it's a hard thing to do, I guess. I don't know enough about piano, but to play those notes and those sequences that were designed for the left hand and the way it moves and thumb and to do that on your right hand is like difficult mm -hmm. and it wasn't perfect. And it posited that like, you're there to see the striving of this artist at what might be the end of his physical life doing this. And it was like so compelling to me. And so what I wanted to see, and it was like, perfection wasn't even like, what is, what is even, perfection is like, what is perfection in that kind? I mean, it's the striving. It's like the, it would have been perfect. Whatever it was, it would have been perfect. Although maybe it wouldn't have been note perfect. And so that was like really like compelling to me. And that's the sort of stuff that I feel like we missed the opportunity to tell. So how would we go about doing that? We need an embedded digital storyteller. Maybe we don't need an, that's where I ended with all that. Like don't hire another second violinist. Maybe that vacancy you'd be better served. Like someone should be, you need to capture these stories and tell them. And in, if we started to do that, and if the story started to matter, then you actually are setting the table in which you'd be like, we want some black stories. We need some, and it's not because I'm going to play the Mozart clarinet concerto differently, but the story I tell about why to play it, where to play it, for whom, how do I know if I did it right? That's a different story that is informed by my lived experience as a black person. So you've got this idea of the digital storyteller embedded in the organization. And if you, if you map onto that, the Andre Watts story, you mm -hmm. have the paper of record putting their attention on one of the seminal artists of his generation. If you're going to draw someone's attention to something, the New York Times is probably the best Agreed. method on the now, planet to do that. I mean, this is the sixth time we've mentioned them. So, right. <laughs> well, I'll I, I will get as many faults as they have. I will I will give up my subscription over my dead body. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now I see. Now I see the program. That's even when, even when I find them frustrating. Um, so, do you think then that if we like anything in life, you put your attention on something and you, you start to see it at a more granular level. If we put the resources towards the hiring of a digital storyteller, put people in front of the camera, put people behind printed interview, that how is that different then, than, you know, we talk about the orchestra as a model of cooperation. We talk about it as a place for per, per personal excellence. That's sort of the thing that's in the background. I don't think we talk about it very much, but it's something that we assume that everyone assumes about us. What values then do we communicate as an institution if we put the attention on on the process? Yeah, that's great. So I, I would say that from there, we're almost close. Uh, you know, the you know, my I, I think you know, this, but if you don't, you won't be surprised. Like my favorite movie is Shawshank Redemption. Right. And um, when uh, Morgan Freeman's character finally gets out, and um, goes to that field and digs up the box and finds the money passport and note from Andy. And it says, uh, if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little farther. And that's what I would say, if you've come that far, that now we're like telling this story, m maybe you're willing to come a little farther and tell a story of lifelong learning as opposed to perfection. And maybe you're willing to tell the story of the struggle and the fear and the vulnerability and the missed notes and the struggling to do things in a body, you know, struggling to do things that you that you won your position demonstrating in a 28 year old's body that is now 38 and 48. And then we might become more human centered we might become 
to your point, um, an organization that defines itself by learning together. And by virtue of our learning together, we can do some things that we that you might call excellent. But our, our what we what we represent to our community is that lifelong learning, struggle, striving, trying, right? As opposed to a, a perfected human life or a perfected human accomplishment, the singular genius, you know, the Beethoven, the Mozart. Now, to your point, what it could become is just like a shitty marketing thing where it's like, great, now I'm supposed to like, you know, uh, what we wouldn't want it to become is just more sideline post-game interview where where an athlete say the thing they're supposed to say, right? Oh, it's not about me, it's the team, blah, 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 blah. And that, right, what we would want though is, and if it was just that, where we just had to sort of perform this perfected, in more circumstances and more narrative, it's like a never ending like donor party, that would be awful and mm -hmm. oppressive. But if it, be, if it was actually the real stuff, I mean, I don't know, man, you know, you and I connected so much, but the connection happens right on the walk from the garage to the hall. And it stops when you get to the stage door, not the connection, but the conversation mm -hmm. about like, what does this mean? Why? Because we have come to learn that like, this is not a meaningful conversation to try to have inside the orchestra. It's, 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 it doesn't belong here, sadly. And so we might find that like, we want to cultivate this conversation internally, right? And that we want to build space for it and we want to develop ourselves around. But that would be the idea that, you know, you're, that um, in doing that, we might be able to transition then to being a learning organization. I know that's very trite right now. Everyone's talking about being a learning organization. I think the thing is, is like, we already are. We actually, already are. The problem is, is that all the learning is in the choose your own adventure place. So we don't, even on a practical level, we've talked about this as like section leaders, like it's like there's very, there's a limit to how much you can talk to your section about how they should be practicing or how to practice this particular passage, you know, even stuff that supposedly like, and the, or there's also, it's also like what we hire the music director to do. The music director is there, the conductor is there to evaluate quality, to be quality to control, to make sure that every plate before it goes out from the closed kitchen meets these standards, as opposed to if it's a learning organization, we would maybe begin. And then, of course, musicians, we like really resent how composed conductors are like often jerks and not really good at like, God, yeah, you just I, I hear you. I, I, I want to yeah. ask you this, what your thoughts on this, though. I remember when I was at the Bellman Forum a million years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the guest speakers said something to the effect like remarking on the the tight window of that the orchestra works in. We don't have water coolers. We don't. We have obviously we have gossip and we have office mm -hmm. politics, so to speak. But we don't have the same kind of spread out work day. We accomplish yep. a lot in a short time. Yep. But I think the learning actually is offloaded to the individual. It we, is because we we circle around the same things, the same kind of concepts from week to week as we apply them to a new program. It is. So is the orchestra actually a learning organization or is it really a planning organization? I mean, our like our capacity is in planning enormous seasons and corralling hundreds of people into place to make this thing happen between September and June or August. Whenever 100%. What you were describing is the way orchestras are. What, what I was saying was the whole like, if you've come this far, if you've got this embedded storyteller and you're telling the real stories, maybe we can come a little farther and actually center ourselves around that and bring the learning, which to your point is now offloaded into the individual. And again, on the choose your own adventure, most of us are doing really actually like amazing jobs of like learning how to find new things to motivate us, learning how to deal with disappointments about like what you know what you can or can't impact in the workplace learning how to navigate a changing body post injury you know learning we're all doing that it's just not seen as the organization's reason you know raison d'etre and it's not seen as even the organization's province and what i was saying earlier is that if a section leader tried to support his or her section in their personal practice it would probably be rejected as like being out of line, like you're now getting into my space. Look, mm -hmm. if you want to talk to me about what I'm not doing right in rehearsal, great. You are, the, but don't talk to me about how I prepare. 
That's mm -hmm. my business, right? So what I'm saying is there's lots of learning happening, but it's just not seen as the, the work of the organization. It lives in the choose your own adventure. As and, you've become more of a public intellectual in the business and you've taken to thinking on stage together with people or thinking in Zoom meetings or going flying around the world talking about this stuff, how have the experiences you've had in Los Angeles and in Juilliard and as board member at Gate, uh, Gateways, how has that affected your relationship with your own instrument and your own work? Mm -hmm. And what do you think you might bring back after after this hiatus to, to mm -hmm. your position in the orchestra? Yeah, I mean, I think that the way my adventure that I am choosing is unfolding, in many ways, I think demand and opportunity for me to practice in this way has increased, in part because the Zoom culture allowed people over the world to be like, oh, like we can make meaningful interactions between people. And so we can avail ourselves of Alex in this or that way, um, as well as the national social climate, particularly around race has sort of foregrounded like a lot of, you know, phone ringing and being like, hey, that thing that you were saying, mm -hmm. can we talk about that now? Like, I'm interested, right? Um, I think that what that will mean for me in Phoenix and what it has meant as it's been happening even before this is I think it's making me a better colleague and better to be around in part because I'm asking less of this practice space, right? And so I'm really settling into letting the Phoenix Symphony be what it is. And the good news is, you know, I had artistic ambition and personal ambition that I wanted to realize. And when the Phoenix Symphony was my only sort of outlet and place for it, I asked a lot of it that it was not capable or prepared to give. And that was frustrating for me, but also I would recognize like frustrating for people to be around, right? Maybe. Um, I mean, I, was, I, I, I would say, you know, look, I'm on the spectrum of like, pain in the ass colleagues to, mm -hmm. you know, pleasant to be around. I hope most people would sort of put me, if we can keep the baskets that broad, I hope most people would put me in the pleasant to be around one. But I think that's one impact, right, um, that it's had. So I imagine that will continue. I, I talk about music not just being sound and what a big realization it was for me to realize that, like, this is not extra musical. Music is sounds and words and people. All music is punk rock, right? It's not just the sounds of Fugazi. It's the narrative about what do these sounds mean? And that's constructed with words and that's constructed by people. What's a good show is like the band on stage, the crowd out there, like people, you can't separate these things from it. And so I don't think that that is a belief though that orchestras subscribe to and classical music largely, so-called classical music largely. It subscribes to the belief that music is sound. These are the best sounds. And by virtue of that, we have this position of subsidy and um, prominence. So I think that uh, I, by being able to express myself as it relates to sounds and words and people outside the orchestra has made me more comfortable with the Phoenix Symphony just being a place for my sounds. The process and performance idea has been has been very eye-opening to me since I first heard you talk about it, because it's one of those things that I see everywhere. It's basically the conceit of this podcast, right? Was the, mm. that I think that my colleagues have interesting stories that I want to hear and learn from, but I also think that even perhaps a non-musician um, and I've got some really positive feedback. Some people mm -hmm. need me to explain the jargon, of course, and that's mm -hmm. and that can be fun in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Have you have you heard the podcast Smartless? Oh well, when you said conceit, I wasn't because it's your podcast. I wasn't going to call you out, but I was like, Brad's listening to Smartless because that's because <laughs> one of those guys is always like, that's the whole conceit. <laughs> also, can we can we can we together uh, write a letter to Jason Bateman and be like, I understand that you you know, but this idea that like other fields are a meritocracy. It's okay. like wrong well, <laughs> I think that he can, I think it's a, it's, it probably feels very poignant to him, but it, it, I think it, really, it does. I think it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. It only really dawned on me the other day how much of a trade show that is. 
Mm -hmm. but, you know, because they do what they uh, interview people, but I thought that was one of the more high profile examples of that. This thing, this thing that is, I mean, of course, those guys are incredible improvisers and yeah. incredibly funny, but that sort of but talking trade shop, trade craft Absolutely. is of interest to a far broader audience. And then the translation of the trend, like the, the Chiron of like what this means in Madison, what this means in Wisconsin. <laughs> very funny. No, I, 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 I agree. 100%. And I imagine that even under the most optimistic projections, they couldn't have imagined the popularity of that show. I would I would bet you're right. You know, they're going on a, like a North American tour. I would go see that. <laughs> yeah, I think they're playing the garden. <laughs> like, the, the Boston Garden? The, the, you're so pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong about that, but yeah. And I feel like that would be fun. And here's the thing. Let's let I me mean, just to play with that a little bit. Like, would I be there just to hear their voices? Sure. But I'd also be there to like be with other people who have enjoying this thing in isolation. And there would be such a celebratory mm -hmm. feel. And there would be this sense of like, these are my people kind of, right? There's a book that um, uh, I want to shout him out just because he was the one that told me about it. I was, uh, I was um, Noah Kagayama, who I don't know personally, but we just happened to be like on a, in a Zoom room at the same time and blah, blah, blah. And he's pointed me towards this book called Marketing the Dead, which offers as its conceit <laughs> that um, the, the Grateful Dead concert is at its core, a legitimate and good excuse to throw a party for the people who come to a Grateful Dead concert. So right, the idea that like, it's a convening thing it's about bringing a tribe together and the concert itself is not a uh, background to that, but it's, um, it serves that purpose rather than thinking like, wouldn't it be nice if orchestras did that? I think orchestras do do that. And the question is, is for whom are we throwing this party and for what purpose? And is it any surprise to us that lots of people are like, I'm not invited to that party and I don't, wouldn't want to go to it anyway because it's not thrown for me. And while yes, you wouldn't turn me away if I showed up, it's like well, the premise of this is not aligned. You know, it's the same thing, it's, it's, the, it's the role music plays as it relates to cultural affirmation and recognizing that that is like a, one of, the, that is a purpose that it plays, that you, you, you go to a concert or engage in a musical activity to be affirmed in your self is it's not the only thing right there's the whole window mirror thing like you know art is a window seeing into new worlds and things art is a mirror getting yourself reflected i can't remember who that's by that's not certainly my thing um so apologies for not being able to source it but uh yeah i think we we don't take any accounting of the mirror piece both from the perspective of like how could it be a mirror for black people or a black person, which has been sort of my practice, trying to make it into one. But also, how is it functioning effectively as a mirror and, and, and for whom and why? You jogged a memory I had of, um, again, many, many years ago at the Mellon Forum. That's uh, and funny, I didn't really think at the time it was such a formative experience. Uh, but <laughs> in a discussion, it was suggested that perhaps many people come to our performances and find them wanting. And that's borne out in the, the numbers around audience churn. And an executive from one of America's finest institutions stood up and had a fit, but it wasn't that he was speaking for the room. In fact, it was embarrassing for everyone involved. But the mm. fact, I think there's a certain amount of laziness around, like the, the inertia that you spoke of before. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, and maybe I'm projecting here a little bit, but my own lack of articulatable purpose institutionally. And that one of my favorite parts of being a musician is getting the opportunity to work with great colleagues on one hand and to play and then and then every few weeks get to play with some of the finest soloists on the planet. Mm -hmm. But it's mixing it up with people in the audience 
going out there with the kids, if it's educa mm -hmm. education, but finding people that look interesting or pre people that look like they might feel out of place at the show and going mm -hmm. to talk to them because you often find interesting stories. But the reason why I'm good at that is because I know a little bit about a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? I can talk to a lot of people about their, their own work and I find mm -hmm. myself deflecting questions about the institution because mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's especially interesting, but I don't know what to say. They're mm -hmm. already there. They already paid the, the price of admission. Mm -hmm. And um, I find, and, and people like talking about themselves, obviously. So mm -hmm. that's a, it's a good way of um, ingratiating yourself. But I do notice in myself that deficit of being able to articulate really what it is we're doing beyond, you know, the exchange of a performance for money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I'll relate like two things. One, you know, A, yes, right? I just feel like, for what purpose? How do we answer this question? For excellence. I'm not saying that's meaningless, but it's still, it doesn't feel like an answer, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to be like, Rob, for what purpose? And you'd be like, for excellence. And I'd be like, excellence for what? So one, I just, you know, I think it's important to note that like not every orchestra has that definition. You know, staying sort of pretty close to home, um, but we know Orpheus as a conductorless orchestra, Drop the Needle, does their, you know, early classical symphony sound significantly different from Rochester's or uh, Phoenix's? N no, I mean, I'm not saying that they're identical. I will say probably what I have come to learn is that like the probably the biggest distinction between why they sound different is actually not even the performance, it's the audio engineer. Yeah. Right? That's like... That's 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 the artistry. <laughs> um, not to say that we're not doing anything. There's just so much great playing, right? So how is it captured? How is it cultivated? How is it? What was the room? All that kind of stuff. But they have a different story. They're conductorless. So that so that so that 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 impacts like how and why you listen to them. That story is in your mind. Wow, you know, especially if if that's a meaningful departure for you. If you have, right? It's a little bit inside, right? I don't know that, um, but I think. If I didn't know what a sport was, but I knew that most sports, most of these teams had a coach, but there was one team that was coachless, I, I might be interested in watching them just because it's like, wow, that's different, that's weird. But going a little farther towards some of the stuff we've been talking about is of course Chicago Sinfonietta, which is an orchestra in Chicago founded by Paul Freeman, a black conductor, which embeds in its, its purpose, racial representation, racial diversity, racial healing, like that's, that's what they're about. It would be a departure or a, a, it would, it, they would not be succeeding on their mission if they didn't have a diverse audience. Is that how they know they are failing institutionally if audiences started becoming less diverse, if they saw that borne out in the statistics? Yeah, I think I think that would be a problem for them. You know, another person who has interesting things to say about this is Michael Morgan, who's the to to reference Rochester, the music director of the Gateways Music Festival, but also the music director of the Oakland Symphony. And I had the privilege and pleasure of getting to hang out with Michael a little bit, just on Zoom. We're not like you know, but just in meetings and stuff like that, because I'm on, I I do some work with some stuff that he's also working on, and. I've gotten to hear him talk about what he thinks the purpose of an orchestra is. And he thinks in or for him, and he tries to have it show up at the Oakland Symphony, that, yeah, the purpose of the orchestra is to convene the community. And so he programs with that in mind. And he, um, a couple of things. One, he'll, he'll collaborate with a local hip hop artist, perhaps, let's say, this is the, the example he gave me, and program that with Schubert Unfinished, intentionally trying to bring to bring these two, the audience bases for these two different artists together into the concert hall. He wants them bumping into each other. He wants them rubbing up against each other, right? Another thing that he told me that I thought was really interesting, and then I had to bear out in my own life, he said he has found he can program the squeakiest of squeaky gate music, and if the composer is from Oakland, then people are okay with it, right? That he's built he's built an idea that like this is the this is truly the Oakland Symphony. It's about us, this people, and this what is it? I don't know, 10, 20 square miles or whatever whatever it is. And I think where that I experienced that in my own life is um I mean you know Rob from knowing me like 
unlike you, who I know has been a big fan of like lots of 20th century, 21st century music, fresh ink, I know you're a big fan of Elliot Carter and you're really good at interpreting and you're really good at explaining and making this music meaningful to audiences. But I've never like liked these sounds and I've also often like resented some of that stuff. Like, you know, I feel like sometimes composers are like, don't consider like, is this even going to feel good for the performer? Like why, you know? Until I had an experience that really made me think about it differently. I was like, what is it I don't like? And I think it relates to cultural affirmation, because here's the story. I had the privilege, pleasure, honor of getting to play Peshan Sori's uh, Cycles of My Being, which is a song cycle he wrote for Larry Brownlee with lyrics by Terrence Hayes and also a few uh, as well by Larry Brownlee. And the... Um, the piece centers on what it means to be a black man living in America today. And Taishan's music is not always easy on the ears. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not easy on the artist. His rhythmic scheme took me a ton of work to even understand like, what is this even saying? If I showed you the score, it's like doing calculus sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's like all these micro, micro subdivisions. And it's like, I think, these just sound like triplets, but in any case, um, he's got an amazing mind. He really does hear yeah. time and, you know, all this, he's, he's just, you know, a tremendous musical mind. And here's the thing, here's what I found. I didn't resent this piece. I'm super proud that I was a part of it. And I really enjoyed the process of both figuring it out and performing, even though it put incredible pressures on me, both in the figuring it out and the performing thing. And I didn't resent it at all. I was grateful for it. And it has to do with how I felt affirmed by this thing, like in, in ways that almost nothing else I've done really affirms. And so I think that connects to that sort of squeaky gate music in Oakland and connects to this idea of like, what is the purpose of this thing? And to what degree is our purpose about cultural affirmation? And I think one of the things that in addition to like, yeah, the sounds and the demands on the body, a lot of contemporary music is the least useful stuff as it relates to cultural affirmation. Until I had this experience, and I was like, oh, wait a second. If the, if the composers, but if this thing, like, and I found like lots of black people in the audience and like stayed for the talk back afterwards and were really into it. And so this theory I had about like this, these types of sounds not being useful. I recognized as you do that, like, it's not that your audience necessarily comes in loving Elliot Carter, but they do like you and they are willing to go with you after you've talked to them a little bit or as they get to know you. So just sort of piecing these things together, right? And like what makes things meaningful and what makes people connect with stuff and how flexible is that if you change some of these elements? You know, different subject matter, different composer, different fellow participants. That's the other thing. Everyone in the ensemble for this performance at its premiere was Black. So it's a quartet for the end of time, a quartet plus singer. And then we actually had to, uh, it was so complicated, man. Like Taishan is, is now attached to the piece as its conductor. Mm -hmm. Really only he can like hold this whole thing in his head. Do you count that as a part of your own evolution then? Is like- is yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. That like, well, go ahead, I'll let you finish the question. Well, I was just thinking in terms of maybe where you started off in terms of like different bodies, but different minds, right? So you're something of a different mind than you were as a 28 year old orchestral yeah, talk. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm still not uh, gonna join you on Elliot Carter. So <laughs> back off. You're no, giving me too much credit then on the Elliot I'm Carter. Just teasing, so. <laughs> I'm just teasing, and the truth is, I would, I would, I'd be down, what would attract me to doing some Elliot Carter would be doing it with you right? The person, like, this is my friend, this is my colleague, this is an artist I respect, he loves this, man, F it, yes, let's eat some snails, let's do it, <laughs> you know, you've been talking about snails for years, I'm in, fine, you're just going to buy me a lot of beers afterwards, <laughs> well, uh, you know what I'm saying, and so I, I just, think, like, that's a legitimate, why is, that's a legit, I think, to, in terms of, like, mine, I see that now as, like, a legitimate and important artistic reason to do something, I think, in terms of being of a mind, it's like, it's not that the contemporary stuff sounds white or whiter. That's not, it's not inherent in the sound. It's like, is it actually, right? Like, who's here? Who's it for? Who's it about? 
you know, that's where the, that's where it's like the, that's where some of that stuff is not useful. And I think to, again, just to invoke the Michael Morgan thing, turns out like if the whole premise of the thing is like, we're about the city of Oakland and the composers from Oakland, turns out that that, that might be enough to, for people to be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm in um, and I'm proud of this thing. Right, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to go home and listen to it, but I'm, I'm proud that, that this is happening here. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure the story is a little bit aggrandized in, you know, both the telling and the retelling, but it resonated with me for sure. No, I think that the regionalism is something that, you know, a lot of places have the opportunity to get back. That cities, different American cities, have different comparative advantages. They have different cultures. Uh, we in Louisville, which is a place obviously with a lot of. Um, nationally recognized culture musically and and but also around bourbon and around horses and all this stuff actually it's pretty fertile soil um to launch uh, uh artistic endeavors and yeah and mix in mixing audiences like that audiences are shared if we think most artists are starved for or like an under 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 capacity of like how many fans they have can right. is there a common ground to bring them together i think it's a, it's a sound artistic and also yeah. just from an economic uh, pos position Alex, I think this is a pretty good place to wrap up. You've uh, talked about a couple of books so far, Rethinking Organ Free Framing Organizations and Marketing the Dead, which we'll put links to. Do you have any other recommendations on reading or watching or listening? The World is Made of Stories. This was, yeah, it was a powerful book for me. It just sort of, it talks about, the, like, I'll, I'll just give you the opening here. So it starts off with all, it's got all these quotes, but it starts off with a Muriel Rukeyser quote, who I think she's a poet, but I don't really know. And it says, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. And then the author, David Lloyd, jumps in. Not atoms, of course it is made of atoms. That's one of our important stories. What other stories make our world? Creation myths, folk and fairy tales, 17 syllable Japanese haiku and three day Indonesian shadow puppet dramas, novels, romantic, fantastic and graphic, television, soap operas, newspaper features, op-ed articles, internet blogs, talk show chatter. A story is an account of something. What's the story on these unpaid bills? If the world is made of stories, stories are not just stories. They teach us what is real, what is valuable, and what is possible. Without stories, there is no way to engage with the world because there is no world, and no one to engage with it because there is no self. And um, so yeah, I, I like that a lot. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, man. It's, been, it's good to see you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. The music on all of these episodes is by the great Louisville guitar virtuoso and my podcast guest, Craig Wagner. Go back and listen to his episode. It was number 20, and it was published back in December of 2020. I want to thank all my guests for making time to talk with me and to share their stories and all of you who have listened and tuned in and written in and had nice things to say and if anyone has any questions going forward, I can be reached at simonsviolin@gmail.com. Thank you.